servants, ladies and gentlemen. Great was my admiration in listening to the remarks addressed to the youth of Ireland a moment since by my learned friend. It seemed to me that I had been transported into a country far away from this country, into an age remote from this age, that I stood in ancient Egypt, and that I was listening to the speech of a high priest of that land addressed to the youthful mortal. His listeners held their cigarettes, poised to the earth, their smoke ascending in frail stalks that flowered with his feet. Noble words coming. Look out. Could you try your hand with it, sir? You have been listening to Joyce's reading of the language of the outlaw speech from Ulysses, one of the few precious bits of Joyce's voice that got recorded. And it seemed to me that I heard the voice of that Egyptian high priest raised in a tone of light heartiness and light pride. I heard his words and their meaning was revealed to me from the Father. And it was revealed to me that those things are good to see a corrupted, which neither if they were supremely good, nor unless they were good to be corrupted, hush up and stop. Why do you do not accept our language, our religion, and our culture? You are a tribe of nomad herdsmen. We are a mighty people. You have no cities, nor no wealth. Our cities are hives of humanity. But, ladies and gentlemen, had the youthful Moses listened to and accepted that view of life, had he bowed his head and bowed his will and bowed his spirit before that arrogant admonition, he would never have led the chosen people out of their house of bondage, nor followed the pillar of the cloud by day, he would never have spoken with the eternal on Sinai's mountain top, nor ever have come down with the light of inspiration shining in his countenance and bearing in his arms the tables of the law, raven in the language of the outlaw. Introducing Mr. James Joyce, Mrs. Nora Joyce. James Joyce was a strong family man, and this always shows up in his novels. He was a traditional man, but at the same time, a great breaker of tradition. He revolutionized the novel. When he wrote, he wore a white jacket with the arms of the city of Dublin on his breast pocket. He dresses neatly, always wears green ties, sports heavy rings on his fingers, carries an ash plant cane which he twirls and twirls. Time magazine, February the 17th, 1930. I'm pleased to introduce to you the gentleman who is a biographer of James Joyce and editor of his letters, who has given us much insight into the life and writings of James Joyce, Mr. Richard Elman. Mr. Elman? Nora Joyce, uh, James Joyce's wife, said that after he died, that the turbulence of her husband and his keen pleasure in sounds were her dominant recollection, recollection of him. Mine are, from reading your book, of his clear tenor voice, his love of wine and a good time, and his ability to kick his legs high in the air. What are your dominant impressions of this man? Well, I, I suppose uh, even more interested in his uh, uh, wonderful ability with words, not merely in songs, but in his own writings. And, well, he's been accused of writing Irish tenor prose. Uh, that isn't really fair to him, uh, because uh, even when he is most threnotic, uh, he always keeps a very good clasp of uh, the, the comic. And uh, so I suppose that what I particularly like about him uh, is um, 
his uh, control of language and the fact that, uh, as I see it, all his work is directed towards a kind of ultimate political aim, although he's considered not to have any politics, but the ultimate political aim would be the emancipation of his countrymen uh, from the shibboleths of church and state. I think that's what he was really up mm -hmm. to. And so what I admire about him really is the tenacity with which he stuck to that goal and the extraordinary variety of means, including comedy, with which he pursued it. Mm -hmm. sun shines for you, he said, the day we were lying among the rhododendrons on Howell's head in the gray tweed suit and his straw hat, the day I got to propose to me, yes. First I gave him the bit of seed cake out of my mouth. It was leap year like now, yes. Sixteen years ago, my God, after that long kiss I knew lost my breath, yes. He said I was a flower of the mountain, yes. So we are flowers, all a woman's body, yes. There was one true thing he said in his life. And the sun shines for you today, yes. That was why I liked him, because I saw he understood or felt what a woman is. And I knew I could always get round him. And I gave him all the pleasure I could, leading him on till he asked me to say yes. I wouldn't answer first. Only looked over the sea and the sky. I was thinking of so many things he didn't know of. Mulvey and Mr. Stanhope and Hester and Father. And old Captain Groves and the sailors playing all birds fly. And I say stooping washing up dishes, they called it on the pier. And a sentry in front of the governor's house with a thing around his white helmet, poor devil half roasted. And the Spanish girls laughing in their shawls and their tall combs. And the auctions in the mornings, the Greeks and the Jews and the Arabs and the devil knows who else from all the ends of Europe and Duke Street, and the foul market all clucking outside Larby Sharon's, and the poor donkey slipping half asleep, and the vague fellows in the cloaks asleep in the shade on the steps, and the big wheels of the carts of the bulls, and the old castle thousands of years old, yes, and those handsome moors all in white and turbans like kings, asking you to sit down in a little bit of a shop. And Rhonda with the old windows of the Posadas, glancing eyes, a lattice hid for a lover to kiss the iron. And the wine shops half open at night. And the castanets. And the night we missed the boat at Alcaceras. The watchman going about serene with his lamp. And oh, that awful deep down torrent, oh, and the sea. The sea crimson sometimes like fire. And the glorious sunsets and the fig trees in the Alameda Gardens, yes. And all the queer little streets in pink and blue and yellow houses, and the rose gardens, and the Gethsemane and geraniums and cactuses, and Gibraltar as a girl where I was a flower of the mountain, yes. When they put the rose in my hair like the Andalusian girls used, or shall I wear a red, yes. And now he kissed me under the moor's wall, and I thought, well, as well him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I, yes, to say yes, my mountain flower? And first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breast all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad. And yes, I said yes, I will, yes. Would you like to say something now that we're on Molly about Joyce's relationship to women and the women in his uh, novels? Yes. I think that uh, Joyce uh, had a serious endeavor to liberate not only men but also women. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there may be vestiges of Victorianism in him, uh, rather difficult uh, if one is brought up in a completely uh, uh, um, Catholic society as he was uh, 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 to um, see things uh, in a totally un-Catholic <laughs> manner uh, but at any rate he did uh, do his best and uh, whatever his lapses may have been I think that was his ultimate purpose. Oh, that's, that's nice to hear. <laughs> Great 
Him neither himself, it is Joseph Mona, and his statue right in the high horse there for Hengist. Father of authors, it is himself. Beyond there, is it that? Yet till the honeying of the loon, love. Die, Eve, little Eve, die. We see that wonder in your eyes. We'll meet again. We'll part once more. The spot I'll seek is the hour you'll find. My chart shines high where the blue milk's upset. Forgive me quick, I'm going. Goodbye. Push your brat and tea and cake, then pipes, tobacco and whiskey punch. To the O'Brien big yard to Christ, it's a nice clean corpse that you will see. To my world, you know you did, did I hear a hole, your gobs at Paddy McGee. Oh, wait, brother, now, don't stay about there, well, the floor, your trotters shake. What's in it, the truth, I told you, lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. That the dead do not stay buried is a theme of Joyce from beginning to end. Finnegan Swake is not the only corpse to be resurrected. When Joyce's daughter, Lucia, was notified of her father's death, she could not believe it and said, what is he doing underneath the ground, that idiot? When will he decide to come out? Has Joyce come out? Is he among us? Well, there seems to be very little doubt that uh, he is among us in some senses. Uh, there is, I suppose, a sense in which um, art does fulfill the vegetation myth, uh, uh, that is the myth that uh, the god dies and is reborn. Uh, the man dies and is reborn, he lives in us, and, and Joyce no doubt is doing that right now. For all their faults, I am passing out, a bitter ending, I'll step away before they're up. They'll never see, nor know, nor miss me. A chittering water vine, flittering back, field mice, bark, talk. Oh, are you not gone a home? What? Tom Malone can't hear the talk of that. All the listening waters on. Oh, talk, Savior. My goose won't moose. I feel as old as yonder Ellen. A tale told of Sean of Shem, all Livia's daughter son. Dark hawks hear us. My whole head all. I feel as heavy as yonder stone. Tell me of Sean, of Sean. Who were Shem and Sean, the living sons and daughters of? Night now. Tell me, tell me, tell me, Elm. Night. Tell me tale of stem of stone beside the rivering waters of. Hither and thithering waters of. Night.